Unspoken Issues. Welcome back to the Unspoken Issues coverage of Valiant's 1992 event, Unity. This episode, we will be discussing chapters 7 through 12, so make sure you seek out our previous podcast giving you the lowdown on chapters 1 through 6. So, since time is not absolute, let's not delay and get right into it. All right, well, let's get to her here. Let's get into Rye number six. Rye number six, Unity, Chapter 7. Written by David Michelini. Pencil layouts by Joe St. Pierre. Sal Valuto with the finished pencils. Inked by Catherine Bollinger. Taking place in 4001, the Eternal Warrior and Rocky travel to the South AM Peninsula to convince Rai to join them to stop Unity. Rai requests to bring along Magnus Robot Fighter, and after some resistance, they agree to go get him. The trio shows up as Magnus begins to battle the evil robot Talpa. Interrupting the battle, Rai, Rocky, and Gilad land their craft on top of Talpa's head, disabling the murderous robot. The team heads off to the entrance of the Lost Land. Immediately, they are attacked, but soon, Erica Pierce, the mother god, appears, telling Rai that his homeworld is about to be destroyed. However, she gives him the means to save it as long as he leaves the battlefield. Struggling with which decision to make, Rai destroys the teleportation device Erica gave him for saving his homeworld of Japan. Erica then shows Rai the fate of his homeworld as it crashes into Earth, and Rai swears vengeance. Well, one of the first things that's very interesting about this crossover is we're, we're seven parts in and we still haven't hit all the titles yet. Like you still, this is the first issue of Rye. Right. You still have an issue of Harbinger and an issue of Solar that we haven't gotten to. I think this is a really fun issue. He's one of my favorite characters. I think he's visually striking. I think some of the aspects of the character come across as uh, what the late Edward Said would refer to as, uh, they would suffer from what he would refer to as Orientalism. In that, like, you know, we're kind of like, oh, everything's like, do you honor your family, right? Mm. And it's kind of a lot of things that, yeah, I don't think it even goes over the line to, like, super offensive or anything, but some of it certainly uh, has to do with uh, our perceived stereotypes time for the time of J- Japan and Japanese culture, which, you know, some are true, but they kind of push it a little bit. But I think Rai is a striking character. I love the way he looks. I love how, like, wise he is. Um, he, he drops a baby off at an orphanage. That's pretty right. cool. Um, you know, yeah. I mean, like, that's the first thing you learn from this issue, if you haven't read anything else, is that Rai is a terrifically noble and honorable person who's going to pay back a debt to the eternal warrior that his family owes from way back. He was going to kill himself to save his son. I think that the three pages where Rai reacts to the destruction of Japan, which they do a great job evoking that 70s disaster movie feel when Japan starts to go down because Japan is already damaged at this point. They really are on their last legs. Grandmother, the robotic uh, entity that like runs Japan. I believe she's, uh, she's dead or on her last legs at this point. The structural integrity of this artificial satellite is compromised. It can transform into a dragon mode. When it does, it doesn't have right. play. And right. then uh, as it comes down, because it tries to transform as uh, Mother God brings it down, you see all of the pain and anguish of the people inside. People are dying. They're hanging from pieces of the uh, the now down satellite. And there's just three pages of nothing but basically full pages in Rai's face in the lower right corner reacting because his whole thing is he's the guardian of Japan. This shouldn't happen. But at the same time, there's no Japan. If they don't beat the mother God, she puts him into like a really, really bad position. He pays the price emotionally, but Japan pays the price physically. It, it, those three pages might be the best pages of the crossover altogether. Like you, if you, if you like comic book pages that are just saturated in action and emotion i it'd be hard for me to recommend three others but yeah by the end of this issue rise mad as hell and he's probably not going to take it uh anymore he wasn't <laughs> taking it before so what does that mean really really good issue keeps moving things along and i really like rise interactions with the eternal warrior and magnus the future warriors feel a little different than the 1992 warriors just subtly nothing to nothing too big but i do like that subtle difference between them i want to ask a quick question and uh, i mean chime in here i like i said before i had never read a whole lot of rye that was one of the titles that i don't think i picked up very many uh if i did pick up any i didn't read them so this is probably the first issue of rye that i actually read all the way through but one of the things that i can tell you is that this 
feels like it has some, I mean, it has to have lasting effects on this guy's title, right? I mean, what the yeah. events that happen here have to ripple through and just continue to affect from here on out. Is that right? Yeah, that's one of the things that actually makes me think this is the best crossover of the 90s. Infinity Gauntlet's obviously great, but at the end of it, Adam Warlock just wishes so much of it away. Right. None of this stuff here is going to be wished away. Japan's fallen. Japan mm-hmm. will have fallen. The events that happen to Rai later in this crossover that we'll talk about on part three, they happen. In fact, at the end of this crossover, Rai number zero comes out, and Rai number zero basically maps out the Valiant universe from 1992 to 4001. What will happen to Bloodshot? What will happen to Exo? What will happen to Shadow Man? What will happen to Solar, etc.? All of this stuff is going to stem from events in Unity that are not going to be undone. And that's one of the things I really, like I said, I really think that the the combination of how the universe built to this moment so beautifully and how the unity, the implications of unity, the effects of unity are going to affect the entire universe going forward. That's the cornerstone to me of why this is the best ever. There are certainly other crossovers that were executed as well. They might have better art, slightly better writing at different points. But for for my money's worth, what really makes a great crossover, obviously it's got to have great art. It's got to have great story. It's got, But it's also got to build naturally out of events that were occurring, which this is great, and it needs to have some real lasting effects. It can't just end like the death of Superman stuff where, well, guess what? He's got long hair now. Right. You know, Coast City, notwithstanding it's for the Green Lantern thing, but you know, right, right, right. For the Superman titles, that's the effect. He has a mullet. (laughs) These things are going to reverberate in Valiant uh, for at least a few years, I think, as people in charge change, editorial visions change. They probably ameliorate some of this after the chaos effect. But for my money, that's what it's about. For the next two years of Valiant Books, everything reverberated. Whether you read Magnus or you read Archer and Armstrong, Unity would affect these titles for some time. And that makes it worth your while. It's not just like, oh, well, what will happen next summer? Atlantis attacked this summer. Next summer, uh, the High Evolutionary will do something. Right. And don't get me wrong. I'm not shitting on that. I like it. But we know that at the end, the status quo will just be restored. This created a new status quo. Kudos to Jim Shooter, Bob Layton, and the other guys at Valiant. The other guy, uh, uh, Steve Englehart, and the other people, Roger Stern, who wrote some of this, who were willing to go ahead and be like, yeah, this is a new status quo. We're moving forward. The Valiant universe doesn't look back. It looks forward, literally, to 4001. Mm. Indeed. Indeed. Uh, I'll get my quick note in here. And I, mean, I, I don't even know if this really contributes anything to this conversation. But, uh, you know, Rocky calling Raya Snowflake just didn't age very well. <laughs> <laughs> just put it that way. Um, Rise Choice was the other thing that I had listed here. We just talked about that, which I think, honestly, out of this whole story that I've read so far, I honestly think that that for me is the moment that I was like, wow, this is this is going to affect this character. And if it doesn't, it's a damn shame. Yeah. Um, so The whole universe. Right. Exactly. Everything's going to change after Unity. Like, uh, Mother God is playing for keeps and so are the editors at Valiant. <laughs> well, first off, I have a question because I was very, very confused. Bloodshot just got a movie. Bloodshot yeah. looks like Rye. Bloodshot uh-huh. is not in Unity, right? No, Bloodshot. Uh, Bloodshot's first appearance will be in Rye number zero and Eternal Warrior number four. They come out approximately the same time. This Rye has nothing to do with Bloodshot. The next Rye will have the blood of the heroes, and the blood of the heroes is literally Bloodshot's blood. And it will be passed down and protected by the Geomancers because different bad guys at different points, mostly Harada, sometime uh, around, like, I think 2015, uh, 2020, like, close to now, there's, like, a 50-year Harbinger Wars where, like, Harada goes after these guys. He's trying to find the secret of uh, immortality. Well, the blood of the heroes would be one of them. He, they managed to stave him off. And at some point, that blood is used to, uh, I think, Rocky infuses the new Rye with it in Rye number zero. So, yeah, they are connected. But at this point, Rye is a familial obligation thing. Grandmother has chosen this warrior to be like the uh, spirit protector of Japan. But it doesn't have anything to do with bloodshot yet. But just wait, Derry. It will. <laughs> right. That's the funny thing for me is I, I always think of bloodshot as the breakout valiant character. But he's basically a, a modern person. I, I think he might even be a mafia hitman who's wearing the Japanese flag as he a costume. He's into 
his thing, I don't think it's supposed to represent Japan. It's just how the nanites in his blood have like manifested. Ah, uh, okay. Like okay, I think okay. that later on, it's very convenient that it looks like Japan. I mean, I, and I haven't read the Bloodshot issues in a long time, so I don't know. But Bloodshot was a breakout star at this point. The uh, the first title after Unity is going to be Bloodshot, and that Chromium cover is going to compete with the Death of Superman stuff. As far oh, yeah. as like, being the hot title uh, in the fall of 92. So Bloodshot becomes their breakout star around this time. And I think inarguably since then, like, they, you know, he's the one that if you people can name one Valiant character, he's got to be the one, right? Like, I don't think there's a lot of others. Uh, maybe some old guy knows who Solar is. I don't know. Turok. I guess Turok's actually the answer. Probably more people can name Turok, but would not know that he's associated with Tom. Well, they don't own Turok anymore, so I, I would say. Right. No, they don't. They, never, they didn't own him then. So, you know, I mean, but like, I'll still... Associate, you know, he was in Valiant, so I would give them that. Also, let me say this real quick before you go back to your thing. When we read the modern Valiant stuff, and I've liked a lot of it, it's weird because I feel like it does miss Magnus, Solar, and Turok. Mm. I don't know why, like, because it's not like they've been able, it's not like it's hung them up. They've done plenty of great stories, but I can't help but be like, I wish Magnus was here. I wish Solar was yeah. here. And maybe that's yeah. just because I'm an old head. <laughs> I agree. Uh, I was very confused when I started reading the new Valiant, Valiant Entertainment, as opposed to Valiant Comics. Right. And I was like, well, where, where, are the, where are the big guys? Where are the guys I know? Right. And it was like, oh, they're Silver Age characters. They never own them. And, I, and then I had to go back and, and look up Gold Key and all this other stuff. So I, I agree with you. I actually thought it was interesting that so much of Valiant was based on licensed characters because then it's one of those things where it's like oh yeah those those don't carry over no one called up you know whoever owns the western license and was like hey we just want to buy these characters so we don't have to break this up uh, i think the last volume of magnus robot fighter came out from like dark horse or something so that's still a, a viable ip but um the other thing i wanted to ask about bloodshot is i guess his name being blood and uh was he just like Rob Liefeld, like a, a Rob Liefeld knockoff no, at this point? I don't think it's a bad coincidence, but his power has to do with his blood. Like he gets, say, I'm a. Oh, there's a thing okay. called like Operation Rising Spirit. I want to say he winds up being the test subject for it. They redo oh, his okay. blood with nanotech, so that's why he can heal from wounds. You know, he's super strong, pretty fast, and everything. But but he already knew about gun, so. So that's what he does, and he becomes a good guy. And also, his death is foretold in ride number zero. The egg breaker known as Axe is destined to kill uh, Bloodshot. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. I read ride number zero, too, y'all. I'm ready. (laughs) I can tell. (laughs) Not to detract with a bunch of questions of a character that isn't in this, but I I was just curious. I figured this was the best place to uh, insert that. Oh, I like Um, it. Yeah, th- this it feels like great. he should be because of what, like you said, the gravity that he holds in the universe. It's weird that he's not here, that he's not even a character yet. Right, but it, it again it, to me, it felt like Rai was the precursor to that because Rai has a lot of major loss in Unity. So again, yeah. to Novus, it almost seemed like they were setting up to, hey, you know who's going to be a big character a year or two after this, once Image is really in the public uh, eye? It's going to be this character, Bloodshot, who's got a familiar look, a more 90s name, and he's set in the in the, in the current period with big guns. So I, I just big thought guns. it was a business. Yeah, why not? I love big guns. And honestly, <laughs> the first like eight issues of Bloodshot are really good. You know, That's about where I tailed off, but like there, there were three. Cool covers, cool concept. Big gun. I'm a sucker for uh, for nanites. I can tell you that. Same. Um, <laughs> I was talking yeah, about it in real life. Why don't we have those in real life so that like I can right. rebuild all rebuild myself? Yeah, That's yeah, good. yeah. Well, you know, as long as they don't gain sentience and decide they don't like us. Hey, you win some, <laughs> you lose some. <laughs> yeah. I was reading this the first time, and of all the things I expected to happen, uh, I did not expect to see the moon of Japan turn into a lizard and fall onto Africa. And that's just one of those things where I love comics, especially from this period of time where nothing is off the table. Uh, I just thought that was great. I wasn't expecting it. The characters only acknowledge it a couple of times going forward, but it's, it's, it's amazing because it's like, 2,000 years from now, what is the country of Japan? It's a moon. What does the moon do if there's trouble? It turns into a lizard. Why? We're not sure. We're not. Oh, dragon apologies. Yeah. Uh, dragon. But it's like, it's like, it's not even a defensive measure. It transforms here. It's missing an arm. There are people falling off of it like flex or like bits of rain. It's, it's right, haunting. Dude. And then right it just on. collides with the ground and you, you, you can see the look on this face like, oh, wow. 
you know, 2000 years of, of being the, the world's greatest hero did not prepare you to lose all the people you're the greatest hero of. So I just, I was floored by that. I really was not expecting it. And, and, and to Dean's point, I think it paid off beautifully. Yeah, man. And the destruction of this thing, just, I'm looking at the page right now as it's laying on its side and the, uh, on, in the Indian ocean, I think is where it lands. And you know, you got the corner box of Rai's face and the so anguish good. on his face. I think Joe uh, St. Pierre drew this and it's amazing stuff. Yeah. You know, just like you said, Derry, it's it's such a crazy thing to imagine this massive city, I guess, uh, that is a uh, well country that's on the back. Yeah, of no, this. it's a nation state like, yeah, yeah, it is Japan. And when it lands, it's not like it just lands on its belly and everybody, you know, OK, well, uh, hopefully some people survive. This thing is sideways. So people are probably, you know, all the buildings and everything are on this thing sideways. That has definitely got some ramifications for this universe afterwards. And if it you were rough. reading the Rye book. Japan's already taken it on the chin a bunch. That's why it doesn't have the leg. That's why right. there's been this war going on. So, like, if you're reading the book, wow, this must really fuck with you. Because, right. like, you've already seen Japan get so much happen, you know, have seen so much happen in Japan that, like, you would think, like, oh, something good will happen. No, Mother God will happen to Japan. Mm. So, it's even a payoff. If, if you were only reading Rai, this is a payoff to subplots that have been going on in the book. Yeah. And that's what? something that happens in this crossover a lot. There's a lot of individual book subplots that, like, become as important to Unity as anything else, and they get wrapped up here. And that's really fucking hard to do during a crossover. Unity may be the only one that ever really gets that right. I, I mean, most of them don't try, which I, I don't want to blame them. Like, you know, who cares who Batgirl's baby is? It's zero hour of crisis or what the fuck ever. <laughs> right? Like, you know, right. but like here, it, they make those things work for the crossover while also paying things off for readers of the individual titles. And I don't know it's a, I don't know if it's ever come together as well, but it's easier when one guy's running the whole fucking show and there are only nine books. We give Jim Cr Shooter a lot of credit, but it's, it's one guy and he's running a company that could close at any minute. Like my understanding of the, yeah, my, my understanding of the making of unity, it's not, you know, we keep picking on, on Marvel and DC, but it's like, they knew they were going to be going concerns. They were trying to get their sales up with crossovers. They still knew there were going to be Spider-Man lunchboxes and X-Men action figures with Valiant. It's kind of like we're doing unity because I, Jim Shooter, believe I created the crossover with the secret wars and I'm going to put every book together with every plot subplot and see if I can naturally tell a story and have something come out of it. Right. And to your point, I don't think anyone's ever done that before because, Mar again, Marvel and DC know they're going to be there next year. Shooter with Valiant was like, I think we should be, but we may not be. Let's see what the heck yeah. happens. So that freedom allows them to do things that I just think as contemporaries would have, wouldn't have dreamed of doing. When you read Crisis on Infinite Earths, I feel like it has tinges of that. But, like, because, no, again, who's in charge at that time? Is it Jeanette Kahn? Is it Paul Levitz? Is it Dick Giordano? So you wind up with, like, there's no cohesive vision. This is a very cohesive vision. And you're right. Unity's a Hail Mary. They had pissed away all the money. You speak of licensed characters, even before they did the superheroes, they did the fucking Nintendo books and the World Wrestling Federation books. And, you know, they got over it like a fart in church. Nobody gave a shit about them. They're much more revered now than they were, at, you know, at the time. And so they didn't have a ton of money. So it... If this did not at least shake things up, even if they didn't turn a, a big profit off of it, if it wasn't in that direction, yeah, Voyager Communications is done by the end of 92. And entertainment this month and American entertainment ads would be a lot different going forward. The, it, it's funny, though, because that's one of the things I really like about it. Not only can the characters be screwed with, but they can change. Like, Rai is right. a long-standing legacy. The Eternal Warrior disappears for centuries at a time. He's got to recuperate. The Geomancer is a new person every time you meet them. It's like there are there are legacies of superpowered individuals and heroism across the centuries, but it's not yeah. about one thing. Like in no. Marvel and DC and even a couple of the other ones who have tried this, it's usually like, well, the modern era is the best. The greatest heroes of all time live now and we'll see their legacy right. in the future. And here it's like, well, no, that's not necessarily the case. Like there's there there are great heroes in, in four thousand and they're even maybe even more noble than the ones today. And there were storylines all the way in between. So I really like the use of that here where the Eternal Warrior throws the ceremonial dagger at Rai. And they're both so steeped in their own personal lore that they're like, oh, yeah, great. OK, I I immediately trust you. I'm going to follow you because we, yeah. we know our history. And Such I just thought that was some great shorthand. 
Yeah. You know, would, would are you going to dishonor your family? Like you, like you wouldn't even be here if it wasn't for me. I say right. your great 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 grandfather, and yeah, you're right. They do a great job. And you read Rise Zero as the companion. Uh, and Jim Shooter said this for for the reasons you're saying. They could do that. They could map everything out in a way that Marvel and DC just could not because it was smaller. They were they were more focused. The characters, you know, would lend themselves more to this. Because like you're saying, some of the best heroes in 1992 are also going to be heroes in 4,000. Like, Solar lives this whole time. You know what I yeah, mean? Right, like, right. You know, so, like, and, and, yeah, you have the Magnus guy then, the Harbinger guys now, and they do a good... What's really weird is how much time is in between them. Apparently, are you from the year 2995? You're out of fucking luck, bro. No heroes <laughs> for you. At least the, the superheroes ain't around, brother. But, um, uh, but yeah, it, it's really neat they leave that whole gap. Even when you read Rise Zero, they tell you what happens to people in between, but there's a lot that could still happen, a lot that could be created brand new within it as well. So, uh, so yeah, really great job there. A great point that even in the DC Universe where the Legion of Superheroes have an important niche, they are treated like they're not as good as the guys now, as evidenced by the fact that every time the 30 of them fight Batman, he somehow wins. <laughs> yeah, I was actually thinking of the Legion, um, I think I asked you guys this before we started recording about the the future force because I was I was fascinated yeah. at the idea that Valiant Comics, the original era of this thing, seemed to pull off having just as an interesting far future as a current time period. And I feel like, you know, even the fact that there were 100 Legion members, I couldn't name more than a handful of their stories. You know, nothing else ever takes off in that period of time. It's always like, oh, hey, these kids are going to be around a thousand years from now. If you time travel, you should know that. But here it's like, oh, no, there's a ton of characters in the future and they're dealing with stuff in you know, interesting terrains and uh, interesting locales. And they know about us and they're not all that impressed so i just i thought they really knocked it out of the park it's one of the things where you can point to for valiant and say you know even if this company comes and goes this is something they contributed harbinger number eight unity chapter eight story by jim shooter and david latham written by jim shooter penciled by david latham inked by gonzalo mayo colored by maria bakari in present day 1992, the geomancer of this era, Jeff, finds the team of Harbinger, requesting their assistance to help Sola. The team agrees, and they head to the Lost Land to meet up with the rest of the heroes there, but are soon attacked by Erica Pierce's minions. During the fight, Sting tries to reach out mentally to Solar, but cannot find him and believe he is dead, so they decide to retreat and find refuge in the woods. However, they get separated from the rest of the team. The next day, the Harbinger team is trying to figure out their next steps when Chris tells Sting that she is pregnant. On the 14th day in the Lost Land, Sting finds the Geomancer, Rye, Magnus, and Gilad and tells them that things have changed and they need to leave now. On day 91, the Harbinger team has found an underground facility where they have made themselves a home as Chris grows larger with a child. Magnus appears asking for the team to help out as their war against Erica is not going well. Sting agrees to lend them a hand the next day, but later that night, as Chris dreams, Sting enters her thoughts and learns that the baby is not his. Enraged, Sting takes off towards Erica Pierce's complex, finding his way in, looking for a way home. When Erica arrives, Sting unleashes a massive blast that she survives and counterattacks, leveling Sting. As Magnus and his team arrive, they pull Sting out of the facility and retreat. Awakening, Sting apologizes to Chris, and the two embrace. Derry, we'll start with you, man. What do you think of this issue? A lot of drama happening here, buddy. I love... Say the drama for your baby mama. <laughs> I love Harbinger. I, I, I've always loved Harbinger. I thought they're a great idea. I would have give I would give anything to know what Chris Claremont thought the first time he read these books, where it was like, oh man, you can do really, really interesting adult themed stories with young people that have superpowers they didn't ask for. Like this, this is just this is X-Men taken to the next level. And I, I just I love it. Uh, I love the drama. I love the back and forth. I love the we didn't necessarily ask for this, but now we have to deal with it. This team also has a version, I guess the original version of Zephyr, the Faith Herbert character, who's kind of the breakout star in the revival in 2012 i thought she was great she's like a, a big fan of the superhero concept of all this she keeps narrating stuff she's got a little cape i love that stuff even though there's tragedy going on around it's like you always need that one character who's like no no, no guys we, we have superpowers like yeah cancer is still a thing don't get me wrong but i can fly i'm going to enjoy that at least for a couple of minutes and i, I always this think this place that's looks like it was designed by jack kirby 
Yeah, buddy, a Kirby reference yeah. in this thing. Hey, Great. hey, yeah. hey, we can never have too many Kirby references. That's right. That's yeah, right. Well, well, true, true, true. I loved this book. I love this concept. I think these are great characters. I love how they integrate themselves into the larger Unity story. They, they are one of, if not the most instrumental part. And it's just it's just great. It's just, you know, I'm sure everyone here uh, who made this book was very familiar with the X-Men books. And it just feels like, okay, we're going to take it to the next level. We're going to add the dimension of having the kid who's not theirs, but he wants to hang out anyway. Uh, to say nothing of the fact that Unity lasts long enough for the kid to be born, uh, which is something I wasn't expecting, but was pleasantly surprised by. What an interesting dynamic to this event. Oh, hey, one of the members of this super team's pregnant, and she's going to have this baby during this event. <laughs> I love how they're like, okay, yeah, we'll help you out. Things change. And obviously, circumstances have changed. This woman is pregnant, and now all he's got to think about is protecting the mother of who we think of what he think is going to be his kid. And he's like, Oh, we've got to leave. He's telling them we're, we're out of here. And they're like, well, nah, solar's gone, man. You ain't getting out of here just yet. So they're kind of stuck with where they're at and trying to make the best of a situation here. You would think that he would be very resentful of Chris and her hiding this secret from him as long as she did. And then at the end, he hugs her and he says, we'll get through it. It says a lot about that character, in my opinion. Sting has not been very responsible with his powers leading up okay. to this point. He um uh, he actually like convinced Chris to go out with him. We, but because the, here's the thing about Harbinger is like is X Men or Legion much more real? Like because this guy has like Omega level powers. So what does he do? He's Omega level t telepathy. What does he do? He makes the hot cheerleader go out with him. <laughs> you know, because he's not thinking he's a teenager. That's the thing that I definitely agree with you about. And I think he is trying, though. I think you're right. He doesn't have the best track record, but he is trying. I think he does slip in here a little accidentally, but not as accidentally as he might want you to think. He put him, you know what I okay. mean? He put it, it's, it's like when you were a kid, you're like, oh, well, I didn't mean to be over here. Well, you put yourself in a position where this would happen, you know? I, I think that the most important thing to realize is he's a teenager. And so he's too stupid to realize that the best thing for him to do if he really wants to protect his pregnant girlfriend is work with these other people to figure out how they can, instead of, yeah. instead of like waiting 190 days and sending Zephyr out to like fucking get, I don't know, like prickly paw fruit from like the jungle book or something, whatever they're eating. And like, you know, and just looking at this from afar, if he had worked with them because he's so powerful, they could have gone home a lot more quickly. But he is a kid and he can't think of things like outside too much of that myopic haze that you have when you're a teenager. So what does he do when he finds out things are bad? Well, he throws a big fit, decides he wants to go home. Yep. Besides, he doesn't have to do any, you know, what you know, anything that anybody says. He doesn't have to work with him. He'll make it happen on his own. And you know, he also is a teenager who can do such things because he has that power. And I think Mother God, honestly, in this issue and in other issues, really sells him short. I don't think she she separated herself too much. She doesn't realize that, like, if Harada had found out this is going on, he'd show up and, like, destroy her. Mm. And that Sting has the potential to do the same thing. She doesn't want to believe it. But he says at one point, like, when they fight here, she hits him from behind first. He's like, I'd have gotten her if she had, uh, you know. You know, cheap shot it. Right. You know, and I think I think he's one hundred percent right. The relationship. She. This is where I'm talking about, like where the personal stuff, the relationships here wind up really impacting Unity. Sting won't work with the other heroes because he wants to protect his his pregnant girlfriend. You know, what I mean. It's not his baby. This baby winds up being very important as far as the future of the Valiant universe. So, like, a lot of the, these are events, like, they already, she already knew she was pregnant. Like, this had happened already. In the beginning of the book, they're hanging out with that family that's working with them, and, like, the, the mom of the family's, like, asking, like, are, are you pregnant? <laughs> um I, I, I really like Harbinger for the reasons that Neri said. Like, this is just, you know... It, I don't want to say it's X Men done right per se because that would not be it, but it's certainly it's certainly a lot more probably what the X Men would be if it was closer to real life, because these guys don't have a fancy headquarters, they don't have a fancy benefactor. Like they're like they're like in the in the comic they're like driving around the country, you know, like stealing cans of tuna fish from gas stations to eat because they're hated by everyone. They're hated by the establishment. They're hated by the non-establishment. They're hated by the people who are, they're hated by the guy who should be Professor X, but they're also hated by, you know, other, 
other government entities that should be looking out for them. So I think I think it's really cool. It would be interesting to see Claremont's response because, you know, they didn't need nearly as many words to do this. <laughs> and also, these are actual kids, and that's a big difference between what the X-Men was at this time and what Harbinger is, too. It's like sure. the X-Men started as supposed to be like a school for kids. At this time, it's like a bunch of, like, 35-year-olds? Like Wolverine, Jean Grey, Cyclops, Bishop, etc. So, you know, I mean, I, I really like that aspect of it, too. So, uh, it's just a really good issue, and you just wind up feeling bad or feeling empathetic with everyone in it. Flamingo, who's so lonely in the issue. Zephyr, who wants to be taken seriously. Sting, who just doesn't know what to do. He just doesn't know why he has all this power and doesn't know what to do. And Chris, who has no powers, is pregnant and caught up in the middle of all this bullshit. Okay, uh, of our players here in Unity, I mean, I'm going like Solar, most powerful, and then would you say Sting, number two? Yeah, probably. Maybe Exo. Rye is Exo's particular- up there. Exo's violent, man. Yeah. Man, uh, he, he is ruthless. <laughs> Rye is particularly, because of his energy weapons, the Mother God yeah. controls energy, but that's energy she can't control. So he is particularly uh, deadly to her and what she's doing. But I don't know if he's as powerful as Sting or Exo in and of, him- uh, in and of himself. The, the only other thing I wanted to point out is... Uh, there's a there's a beautiful page of art in this comic. Um, it is about a third of the way through, and it it has a, a legion of giant lizard cyborg people coming at our heroes <laughs> with giant mech and flying things in the background. Like it just it looks like some some like beautiful you know Michael Bay nonsense, and, and I love it because you just have the two characters in the front they're the smallest characters in the frame they clearly have no idea what's going on uh and it's just it's just a well-designed page i like it because again to go back to the the x-men analogy it's like oh yeah if you were to take a bunch of kids that weren't trained as child soldiers with their magic abilities they'd be dropped in this situation they'd be like what do you expect me to do here with the robot lizard man in the far future? So I just like, I am 15. I have not had my first kiss. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> one... I'm supposed to fight this cyber dino. <laughs> it was one of those things where it feels familiar, but at the same time, it, you wouldn't have gotten this from something else on the shelf at the same time as this. I just wanted to give that credit. Um, mm-hmm. You know what that part reminded me of? Y'all ever play, speaking of more X-Men comparisons, y'all ever play the X-Men arcade game that came out around this time? Like, do you remember this? Like, it's like the, the forest or the caves where the dinosaur guys start showing up and there's all these sentinel looking guys with like bazookas and they're riding like future cyber trucks. Yeah, that's what this reminded me of where I was like, oh shit, if you, you better watch Watch out. Those things can, like, tail whip you. You're going to push these a lot of quarters here. I guess the only other thing I was going to say, and this continues as uh, we go on, Eternal Warrior and Magnus and the relationship with Sting is amazing. Good uncle, bad uncle. Like, Magnus is like, hey, man, he's a good kid. He's trying his hardest. Eternal Warrior's like, who's this fucking crybaby? I've been fighting for thousands of years. You better watch yourself, little punk. Magnus is like, hey, maybe, uh, you know, he's having a rough time. He's just a kid, you know. <laughs> so I do enjoy that interplay. And I honestly feel as a young man, you need that kind of inspiration from men older than you that you look up to. And you can tell Sting respects both of these guys. And for you to develop, you need an older man who's like, hey, you're doing all right. And you need an older man as a young man who's like, you're kind of shit in the bed. <laughs> you know, and you take that advice and go on. I, y'all are both, you know, obviously we're young men at one point. It's really hard to overstate the importance of the acceptance of older men to younger men. It, you know, I mean, as your development and growing up, you really, when you're like 15, 16, 17, you really want like guys to think you're a man, that you're a part of this club. And I think that these guys, and I think this is part of Sting's development of becoming a man. These, these two guys would be that kind of influence on them. Mm-hmm. I'm sure I don't have to explain it to y'all. And people who aren't your dad or your, or your real uncle or stuff, you need this acceptance from outside of that circle. And he, and he's kind of getting it here. He'll get it eventually from Eternal Warrior. Hang in there, kid. Solar, Man of the Atom, number 12, Unity, chapter 9. Jim Shooter as writer, penciled by Don Perlin, Stan Drake on inks, Mike Cavallero on colors. April 3rd, 1992, Erica Pierce appears at her own house just after her other self has killed her husband. This new Erica then kills the Erica of this world and takes her son Albert with her and leaves for a new home. 
The next day, April 4th, 1992, Jeff the Geomancer and Solar at Erica's home believing the aftermath to be a murder-suicide. From September of 1993 to 2022, Erica and Albert are still living together as neither of them have aged. Finally, in 2087, on Albert's 100th birthday, she explains what has happened, how Erica was part of the explosion created by Solar, she was sucked into a black hole, and how she killed Albert's real mother, and now how she plans to kill Solar. In the year 3002, as Albert is in his late teens to early 20s, Erica takes advantage of his loneliness, reassuring him that they are really not mother and son. Near a thousand years later, in 4001, Erica has developed a cult following, and their efforts have been strictly put towards an event called Unity. And the day of putting her plans towards Unity have arrived. Now in the Lost Land, Erica prepares for a confrontation with Solar while Albert watches on, hoping he kills this woman he used to think was his mother, but now hates with every fiber of his being. However, he also watches Shadow Man interfere, and Erica then captures Solar in a small chamber. Erica goes into the chamber and reemerges, saying she has finally killed Solar, and Unity can continue once they kill the rest of the Resistance. This is it. This is where we have to talk about this angle that's going on with Albert. We don't have to talk about anything. We can all quietly back up and not talk about it. That's cool, too. <laughs> okay, it's... Sting. Go back to your little headquarters, Sting. You're too, you're too wuss-ass. You gotta face life as it is. This is one of the creepiest comic Creep. books I have ever read. And I have read thousands of comic books. This one made me genuinely uncomfortable. Right, it's one that, the only one that I can think of off the top of my head that made me more uncomfortable was that weird Mark Miller one where, like, he just created a bunch of Looney Tunes characters to get, like, raped and killed, and it's terrible. Yeah, and I'm like, why is, would yeah. anyone fucking do this? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Was it? It, was called the, it was called The Unfunnies. Yeah, fuck that shit. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, and the well, joke... Oh, yeah, don't re honestly, don't read it. You oh, yeah, don't read it. You your mind once you do. No, I don't should read not it. have done so. I wish I had not. And at least on the one hand, with the stuff we're talking about here, the the you know, and I'll, I'll let the cat out of the bag. Erica Pierce molests her quote unquote son. At least here, it stands. It, it actually makes more of a story point in that she is ultimately becoming the thing she hates most. She was molested as a kid. She was abused as a kid and a wife. And they're trying to show you that like she, this tyrant lady who thinks she's not a tyrant, is actually as bad, if not worse, of a tyrant than the tyrants who've been pushing her around. I'll let the cat out of the bag. I don't think that this incident thing was necessary but i understand why they put it in because it was supposed to be a full circle thing because at one point later on when jeff's talking to her she's like you know you can hate you just like you hated the games your daddy played you know so you're supposed to say she has become the thing that she hates and probably always has been in a way because she was too scared to face herself the way uh, a lot of really brave people with mental illness have to. A lot of really brave people have been traumatized and abused like you have to. You're either going to you're either going to go on to be the abuser like her or you're going to go on to try and stop that from ever happening again like a lot of other brave people who have suffered such things. My girlfriend would say I was one of those people. I don't want to put myself like, oh, look at me, Dean Compton, Mr. Brave. <laughs> but like I do try and work hard to where like nobody gets you know uh tyrannized nobody gets that that's what you're supposed to do she didn't get the message because she's too, she got too lost in the hate right and also gonna... she's a wuss ass that's the other thing because she doesn't want to be lonely but she also doesn't want to actually she doesn't want to show anybody who she is you can't have it both ways you know what i mean instead she's trying to control this kid whether it's by not aging him whether it's by giving him fucking uh super robots or whether it's by like you know having sex with him she's just lonely and this is a way to keep him under her thumb as opposed to because if you want to have friends you want somebody to fall in love with you you want to have meaningful relationships you have have to expose yourself you have to make yourself be weak she was too hurt to allow herself to be vulnerable and weak and therefore the only thing she knows is control and she knows it in the most despicable ways possible yeah. sorry i went off on a tangent but you know nope. it's kind of an area of expertise for me because yeah i was i was abused as a kid physically mentally and sexually and you you know these these and i've seen this in a lot of places usually with a lot less cosmic power but you either go the mother god route and you're a bad abusive person or you work hard not to be like that even if sometimes you don't do as well as you'd like what i've read from shooter is kind of what i said he's like it's not just to make her evil it's to show that she is the exact thing she hates okay all right like it's not just, he's trying to be like this isn't just another evil thing that happened gotcha 
I think in hindsight, he'd probably do it differently, just like he'd probably do Avengers number 200 a lot fucking differently. Oh, um, God. I think he'd do these things a lot differently now, but I do think that, like, at the time, he he felt like this was character appropriate. We, I don't think it's necessary, but I, but I get it. Unlike other things we're talking about, like the unfunnies, where you're like, why? What's this about? Uh, I will just say this much. Uh, you know, I'm reading this story, and yeah. I know I told you guys going into this, I, I had never read Unity, and when I'm going through the pages and all of a sudden, you know, I start to pick up on what's going down between Erica and Albert uh, and that whole horrible situation. I couldn't believe what I was reading. It, it's not like they let off the gas on that thing either. Cause no. it, they are like, Hey, this is happening. And Oh yeah. And this issue in solar man of the atom number 12, you're going to see just how it progresses to get worse. And you're going to see that moment where she makes the decision to take advantage of her son. I feel like also, and this is a terrible thing to say, and I'm very sorry. I feel like it would be slightly less creepy if her, if like Albert didn't look like such a fucking putz. Like he looks gross. He has a terrible looking face. It's just like I want to punch him so bad. And I don't listen. I'm not saying oh it's his fault or whatever you know any of that shit. But like he just looks so putzy. He just looks. And that also, shit. I think it's important to note that like while he is abused and he was abused at the point that unity is about to happen, he's trying to turn the tables and use the like it's also given him leverage and in some cases that means that victims try and turn the tables on their abusers by using that leverage and that's where he's at he knows he can manipulate he can get out of anything like you know when uh, when we get to the archer the next archer and armstrong issue where he was having them try and kill her well it doesn't you know it doesn't quite go down the way he'd like and then she she's like what's your deal he's like oh they captured me and made me tell and she's like they're terrible he's like ha ha you know yeah. so he used is this relationship for his own benefit as well. He's also a goddamn fucking terrible fucking bar uh, patron. He's <laughs> beating up the ladies and stuff. He's terrible. He He's taking all the He's mellow horrible. paper. I want but, the mellow paper. It also gives him the impetus for what's going to happen here later. She's doing this to him, and he absolutely hates her for it. Yep. He And, and as well, he should. But, but once again, it, you're showing us what does he do with his time. Right. What does he do? What's his life? He goes and beats up people who are weaker than him. He goes yeah. and sexually abuses people who are weaker than him. He goes and it's just a cycle. She's passing. He is the, he, because of what she's done. He has become the same of, as her. And I feel bad for him, but not too bad. Yeah. The only thing I will say is, however we get there, you do end up with a very interesting relationship for uh, Mother God and Albert. We've definitely seen before where all powerful villains have a lover who they don't treat right or, uh, you know, they enter the relationship not under the best of terms or they just wanted something and eventually they betray them and, you know, you kind of buy that. But here it's a very specific type of betrayal because it's constantly active. Like Dean mentioned this, but there are numerous parts in this story where Albert, who's the prince of the realm, is just like, oh, I think you might be able to kill Mother God. Great, I'm going to give you all the access you need and whatever needs to happen to get you here because not only uh, has he been abused and he's in this position of power, but uh, as we've mentioned, he's also a drug addict. Like, he's his his ability to make good decisions is, is completely distraught. So I, I kind of like how that sets up the larger story because, you know, in, in your classic way of telling one of these things, it's Mother God who allows for her ultimate downfall. Like, she did everything right she built the doomsday weapon she trapped the hero she she set the pieces against each other she did everything you're supposed to to make sure that you end up with the winning victory but of course the one thing she wanted along the way is the thing that proves to be her downfall and i won't spoil exactly how that is because i know we have another part coming out but i did like that and again it, it says you know whoever designed this whether it was jim shooter alone or him and the other creators However, they got there, they got to a point where it was incredibly interesting and very rewarding. Uh, and I don't know how many other places you can say it. Again, I think it was unnecessary. I think this comic is yeah. really creepy. And I don't mean that in a way like it's it's lewd or it's drawn. It's just like you read it and then you read it again. And it's just like, I don't want to recommend this to someone. I don't really want to give it to someone, even if it does get you to a good place later, if that makes any sense. Just so people know, it's not just hinted at. We're not just reading into it. Like, like this comic is twenty pages. It's it's spelled out pretty. No, it's spelled out, but never shown, which makes it creepier as well. 
Sure, sure, sure. Like, I mean, not that you yeah. needed to see anything explicit, like you don't see anything, but the idea, like, she never, she's like, she doesn't say, like, hey, sex time. She's like, you know, I'm not your mother, not really your mother. You know, like, like, she, like, it, which is, which in a way is like oddly creepier. Crazy. Yeah, oh, trying, it's much creepier. Yeah. He's yeah, trying yeah. to phrase it in a way where it's like, oh, well, this is fine. There's nothing wrong with this. There's yeah. absolutely something wrong with this, Erica. And you're just perpetuating the same cycle. And if you, and, and, and again, uh, anybody out there who is struggling with like any kind of abuse or something, you, you have to work hard to a, a break the cycle. And if you need help, honestly, reach out to me personally. I'll do what I can, find whatever uh, resources I can for you. But like, this is what happens when you don't break these cycles. You were molested, you molest your kid, you were abused, you bully your kid. Now your kid wants to kill you. Your kid's going to let Archer and Armstrong kill you. That's the PSA. That's true. That's it's true. true. It's true. Yeah. You know, you got to watch out. If you're bad to your kids, the Eternal Warrior will fucking show up and punch your head off. <laughs> I wish that, that should have been the tag life. This thing ever gets collected again, that's gonna that's right at the top. Time is not absolute. Also, the eternal warrior, <laughs> head puncher. I tried to do the math on Albert's aging, by the way. You actually have a, a solid starting point because he says in the book that he's 13. So he, it, it was 100 years after his de- uh, after he was born. So it was his 100 year birthday. He's like, I'm actually only I'm actually only 13. Math don't work, by the way, because he should be like 77. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if, if that, probably a hundred by four thousand one. So I, I think. Well, but she can keep him as young as she wants too. So she's yeah, she's working on some kind of thing yeah. in the background. I remember that's. And they're in the lost mostly. land, and time right. is not absolute, except in the. Hey, so guys, maybe, that, maybe that has something to do with it. But anyway, I blame that's the all liberal I'm... media. Okay, <laughs> many people do. I think the thing that I uh, that I would say about this, and also I think it's in Harbinger as well, is it shows how powerful Sting is because he's the one who tells everybody, hey, Solar's gone. Because despite right. all of that electrostatic and the energy barrier she's thrown up and the bionosaurs, um, uh, he yeah, can still awesome. sense like Solar's energy pattern in mind. And so without him, who knows what would have happened? Because like they might have pressed on, and if they pressed on at this point, they all just fucking die. So it just shows how powerful Sting is. And again, that happens in this issue. This issue is also like, I would say it's really good in that like, it's wild how little actually happens in it. For a superhero story, story smack dab in the middle of a goddamn cross over not a lot of ray beams or punches thrown and i really appreciate that but it creepy shit aside it maintains to be it it still maintains that same entertainment level you're ready for the next issue you're ready for the next page this is the issue that has the panel in it that i sent you guys there last night toots pleasure den charlottesville virginia june 11 3002 this is the yeah. one that has the eternal warrior in it and what looks to be a really old jeff which i mean by this time he would be really really old what he would be i like, don't think he- it's jeff i forget who but like in rye number zero they tell you who all the uh, geomancers are gonna be and oh. i remember seeing this guy it is this guy okay like, that is the eternal warrior and the geomancer of that time but it's not all right yet. Yeah, so this is happening. Well, Albert is philandering with some girl on the side here, doing something. And Bragging about secrets he was specifically told not to talk about. He's like, <laughs> "Yeah, my mom's gonna kill Solar." Like he's like the kid on like like he's like the kid on the bus who's like telling you like all the stuff. Like, my, yeah, my dad owns thirty seven guns and they smoke weed and like all this stuff. Like, I don't think you should be telling people this. Yeah, so they these two are kind of keeping tabs on. Uh, Albert at this time, but uh, clearly, as we talked about last night, they're not. I thought this was happening in. I thought this was happening in the Lost Land. I forgot this is actually happening in three thousand two. So this is way before Unity even started. Uh, but anyway, okay, all right. Let's get to Eternal Warrior. We've crossed the halfway point. It's time for Eternal Warrior number two. Eternal Warrior number two. Unity chapter ten. Written by Jim Shooter. Art by John Dixon. Colored by Mark Cesar. We are back at Unity Day 1, shortly after the team comes together and is attacked by Erica's Lost Land minions. The team is made aware by Sting that they believe Solar is dead and end up retreating. Gilad and Jeff find a place to hide, meeting up with Gilad from 4001. Gilad heads back out to find the others and Jeff joins them. Unity Day 157 and the team are reunited and making another attack on Erica's compound. Meanwhile, the Harbinger team meets up with Jeff back at Resistance headquarters as Chris is about to go into labor. Just then, the two Gilads return, the future one injured, explaining that they are still falling short of trying to stop Pierce's march towards executing their plan of restarting reality. That night, the team prepare for a possible all-or-nothing assault. 
but Jeff sneaks out. Breaking into the low-level fort, Jeff ends up getting captured. The Gilads go to find Jeff, and they infiltrate the facility. Jeff meets with Erica Pierce and explains that the Earth doesn't want her to kill him, and that he understands her painful past and how what she is doing is trying to wipe all the hurt away. Jeff also tells Erica that her son spies on her with the intent to hurt her because he hates her, just like she hated her father for what he did to her. Just then, the two Gilads attempt to rescue Jeff, but Erica appears to vaporize him before they can. Future Gilad loses all hope and is almost willing to die before young Gilad convinces him to leave and fight to escape. Future Gilad says that he knows they cannot win without Jeff and believes it to be over. Young Gilad is able to convince Future Gilad to continue fighting as he believes anything is possible. Well, first off, Eternal Warrior number two, emphasis on two, right? Because there's two of them in this one. So pretty good. Pretty good right off the bat. I really like the interplay between the older and younger Eternal Warriors. They're both it, they're both willing to swallow their pride at different points. Like at one point, he's like, I should do this. The younger one is. But the older one's like, no, I rode, I rode a steed kind of like this in like the 27th century. You haven't done that yet. Let me. He's like, okay, well, yeah, you go ahead. I like how they're trying to like be better people while at the same time, you know, recognizing their limitations. The older one, it's so sad when the, the older one's like, you know, trying to be like, oh, I don't remember it. I don't remember it. They're like, what's going on? He's like, I, I do remember it. And it went a lot better when we did this before. I don't know what's going yeah. on now. Right. And every time something bad happens, I just, I'm losing a little more of myself, a little more of my soul. He's like, well, you know what? It's it, At one point, he said, it's the land beyond time, like outside of time. Anything's possible. The younger uh, Gillet is like, well, I'll try and avoid an argument that the older one mentioned them having with Armstrong. And then they split, and they never, like, saw each other again. And you start, you know, keep remember what you said. This is a, a land beyond time. Anything's possible here. And anything possible, I mean, the good guys could lose because the one old, the the, uh, the older one gets a scar when the younger one, like, bashes his face open. And so that was a really cool thing because one of the critiques of this would be like, well, but we win, right? Because, like, these people are in 4001, and one of the ways to show you things can change is, like, something as little as a scar showing up right, on the same right. character, you know, thousands of years apart. I don't know how Jeff lived. That's a big thing mm. for me when, like, Mother God blasted him. He does live, but, like, I really, I don't, I, I could not figure out where uh, in this issue or the next. It supposedly uses a secret door that, you know, we just didn't see. I think my favorite part about this issue is honestly just how nice Jeff is and how, how nice the Earth is to Jeff or in this world where it's like, he doesn't want to be destroyed. He's trying to ask you nicely. And he goes to be like, listen, I know you were hurt. I know you were, you know, bad things happen, but like, we can move past that, but like, don't destroy everything. And of course she's too far gone to even, you know, you know, consider such a thing, but he does hit, he does, uh, he tries to be nice. And then when that doesn't work, he starts doing the number one thing to hurt someone like mother God pointing out things like, well, you know, your kid hates you. You know, you're, you know, you were abused. You're never going to undo all that abuse. You know, you're sort of full of shit, right? Like this is this is not making sense. You're just a scared little girl still. The record told me, <laughs> you know. So, so I just find this issue to like this issue. Honestly, like after the last one where I said like there wasn't a lot of action, this has much more action, but just as much introspection and just as much character development as the solar issue that preceded the crossover. So. It might be the best uh, issue that doesn't have a big revelation in it in the crossover. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I really do enjoy time travel mechanics in my comic books, and you get plenty of that in this oh, story. Yeah. Because that, there's there's a lot of that, and two Gilads running around with each other. Imagine if you could run into yourself. You, it, people like us were like, oh, man, if I could go back and talk to myself 20 years ago. This is a person who's come back millennia <laughs> I mean, right. thousands of years and is now talking to a, a previous younger self. I wouldn't wouldn't blame the man for forgetting a few things. Plus, he's got the psycho probe stuff going on. But, yeah, just like you said, he's starting to realize that things aren't going like they should have been. You mentioned the scar mechanic happening, which was great. Love seeing that because that really does throw a spin on things like, oh, there are stakes here. 1992 Eternal Warrior could die. So, and not only um, that, but like the part where you see them in the interim, 
I don't know, was that in this issue or the solar issue? But like they also it also reminds you that they can't go fight him then because it's not time yet. Because mm-hmm. if they do, they'll just get massacred and, and like it can't happen unfold like it's supposed to. So he at least remembers enough of that to not go mess with it at that point. But keep tabs on this just in case because he probably also remembers that it never goes quite the same each time. Keep tabs on this in case something new's happening, but keep in mind you can't go like punch Albert in the face and win. Jeff getting vaporized, I mean that it, it it starts to make you see the difference between the two eternal warriors because one loses hope right and then the other one is like well you know somebody told me that uh you, you know there's no reason to lose hope something along those lines basically one's got a definite dire outlook because he believes that we can't do this without him i just watched him die for all intents and purposes he believes that jeff is dead as we're coming out of this One's lost all hope, but the younger one's like, no, we can do this. We, 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 let's not lose hope just yet. And that's kind of where they end things as they run off. If I remember correctly, I think they just kind of run off away from the facility. Again, Erica, who just about kills one of our heroes, but they, they go up against her and then they get the hell out because that's what they have to do. She does kill one of them, or at least it seems to be. Well, good point. Yeah. I mean, it does look like she's killed Jeff. So my favorite scene in this issue is the one with the record. Uh, yeah. I, I love that the geomancer, again, the, the sorcerer, the magic guy, the one who listens, whose power is all about listening and being able to uh, hear things no one else can, decides to try to reach the villain in a nonviolent way. I so love what that, is, too. Yeah, I, I thought it was beautiful. And I had a Why don't few- we just ask her to stop? <laughs> let's give it a shot you know but let's like, see seriously like she's she's an abused person and sometimes all they need is somebody to be like hey i care about you quit this maybe it'll work right that's exactly my point is you know mother god's whole thing is i want to create a perfect world perfect as defined by me and what does that really mean that means a place where no one can be hurt right right i mean that's that's probably what she would say so I like the fact that Jeff goes in here, hands open. There's no knife or dagger or weapon hidden on his body. It's it's his way of saying, you are clearly going to accomplish this, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to cause havoc, even if you get part of the way to what you're doing. What do you want? What makes you happy? Oh, this makes you happy. I was told by the world who remembers you and remembers what you went through and feels bad it couldn't help. This made you happy. Why don't you listen to this? And why don't you see if we can find some middle ground? You're clearly right. very accomplished. Maybe we can do this without all my friends dying. So I just thought that was great. I, I, I thought, you know, if nothing else, the scene where Mother God then vaporizes Jeff is a great way of saying, well, we tried, right? We tried the high road. We tried to reach her and the best of us was killed. Now, he does come back later. I'm not sure how. I didn't lose any sleep over that, but still, it was one of these things where, in the context of this issue, for the person to try, uh, the person who tried to be the most kind to her, to be punished the worst, I thought was was really good because it shows just how far gone she is and why the actions later will make sense. The other thing I really liked about this is, is you guys were discussing, you know, Gillard basically talking to himself. I love the fact that he really hasn't changed all that much. Like, you know, no. we call. Yeah, I, I thought that was kind of interesting. You know, we call him the eternal warrior and he's eternal in the sense that the way he was at the beginning in, ba- in ancient Babylon hasn't changed and isn't going to change. Like certain things about him are going to get a little different, but he even makes a point of keeping his hair the same. Now, a lot of that is just, you know, the artistic nature of, of superhero comics, but part of it too is like, it's like, yeah, he doesn't, he doesn't want to change, right? He He's happy to find his war to fight, to every once in a while check in with his closest blood relative, who is also seemingly immortal and unkillable, so he doesn't have to worry about that. And he's probably got more kids than he can count or even knows about, so he doesn't worry about keeping track of that stuff. And I thought that was kind of interesting, because these two essentially old men are meeting up yeah. and talking about it and going like, oh, what do you think? Oh, what do you think? Oh, what do you think? And then they realize with the scar scene, like, oh, wait, we're outside of time. You know, this inevitability that has driven both of us in our lives is is suspect. We can both die here. The fact that you remember one way of this going and the fact that I'm living a second doesn't matter. We could both be killed tomorrow and our stories will or will not continue. To say nothing of the fact that if Mother God gets what she wants, we'll have never existed in the first place. So I thought that was good because, again, it, it raises the stakes. You know, This is not a closed loop time travel thing. Like Everyone can die, everyone can go away, and everyone's story can end. So I thought that was great. And again, a, a nice way of doing it uh, someone isn't standing there with a chalkboard explaining that it's just two guys talking one of them gets hit in the head and i thought that was great 
Yeah, also, yeah, much yeah. like us, the Eternal Warrior finds his younger self to be, like, annoying. Because he, he gives the raw raw speech to his older self. He's like, I can see why Armstrong is so annoyed by you. <laughs> um, uh, and th- to go back to your point about um, about Mother God, um, yeah, you're right. She's trying to create a world where there's no pain. And and, and because I deal with this stuff, that's called, like, withdrawal. And a lot of people with PTSD, a lot of abuse people do that. Nobody can hurt me if I don't open up. If I just, you know, mind my own business and don't talk to anybody, if I don't make any friends, if I don't ever, you know, put myself out there, then nothing bad can happen to me. Because you're trying to, and ultimately she is trying to do this on a quantum mechanical level that we can't imagine on, you know, cosmically. But yeah, she wants to create a world where no, where she can't get hurt, where nobody can get hurt. And the sad part is when you try and create that world, and I know this from experience, you only hurt yourself. That's what you're doing. You can't overcome the bad things that happen to you, as weird as this sounds. You can't over overcome that vulnerability until you're willing to be vulnerable in another way. And she and a lot of people uh, do this. They snap or they reach, you know, they, they, they react poorly. They just don't, they're, they don't think properly about what they're doing. And then they push away the people that are trying to help them with their uh, mental illness and their trauma in, in our world. That's what she does when she kills Jeff. That's, that's exactly what it is. It's like, I don't, don't need help. I don't need pills. Right. I don't need to go to therapy. You guys are just wrong. I'll, I'll fix it. You know, get the fuck out of here. You don't care about me anyway. Boom. Yep. You know, so it, it's really interesting to see those psychological um, tropes is not the right word for it, but those psychological behaviors play out in, in, in a way in a superhero comic where they have meaningful consequences. Let's go ahead and we will move on to our next issue, and that's going to be Archer and Armstrong, number two. Archer and Armstrong, number two. Unity, Chapter 11. Script by Jim Shooter, Barry Windsor-Smith on story slash drawings, Bob Layton on inking, and Maurice Fontenot on coloring. Unity, Day 16. As Albert looks on, Archer and Armstrong are invading the stronghold of Erica Pierce. When Archer believes he has the drop on Pierce, he shoots her, but she shakes it off. Albert leads some guards in and they arrest Archer and Armstrong before Erica can kill them. In jail, the pair are soon given a way to escape when Exo Man of War crashes through the wall, wrestling a dinosaur. The next day, Erica looks to send her servant Turok to track Archer and Armstrong while Albert wants them dead. Turok believes Erica to be someone called the Spirit Mother and feels he must do her bidding. That next night, Archer wants his crossbow back, and both are trying to find some body armor that will help them get through Pierce's defenses. Just then, Turok attacks, driving them for cover. When Turok has them down the shaft of an arrow, he looks for reasons not to kill Archer, as he believes Archer to be a noble person, but does not understand why Erica tells him he is evil. When Erica overhears Turok's conversation with Archer, she accuses Turok of betraying her. Turok then gives Archer his bow back and breaks his own weapon, swearing he will not serve his spirit mother any longer, and walks away, leaving Archer and Armstrong to try and find the rest of their team. Uh, my, my first note is Turok, baby. Turok, yeah. dinosaur hunter. Hey. Uh, showing <laughs> he up doesn't here have and... a title at this time. And this yeah. might only be his second appearance in the Valiant Universe ever. I'd have to It look. really, it, well, it took me, because you, I think, on our last podcast, uh, told me when his first appearance was. It wasn't yeah, this Magnus one, because I thought 12. it was. Right. I thought it was because they were treating him, like, they were giving him the first appearance treatment. Like, hey, I'm Turok, dinosaur hunter, and this is that, and this is that. It felt like a very real introduction to this character most likely it was just done that because you know he's not showing up very often uh, in books and if it is a second uh, appearance then good and this enough. whole thing is going to launch his book though because when he gets shot out of the lost land into 1992 all a bunch of bionosaurs which these dinosaurs go with him and that becomes his job in fact in ride number zero him and eric exo they go dinosaur hunting and uh, interestingly enough eric does not bring his exo armor he's got a big spear Oh, Way to go. I guess they're doing it old school, you know? Yeah. But, uh, that's, but that's, that's his, Eric. That, this comic is almost like a backdoor pilot for Turok's uh, book. He's been in the Lost Land for a while. He's done a bunch of uh, stuff from Mother God. Feels bad about it. Gets shot out into 1992. So, so did some dinosaurs. I'll kill him. <laughs> So the other thing that I had listed here is something that comes out of Erica's mouth a couple times, actually, throughout this series. And again, it's another representation of her, you know, her, her uh, abuse past. Uh, all men are liars. She says that a couple times throughout here. And I can't remember. She, that I think it's right after Turok 
betrays her. I have that down as a note as well. So anyway, all right, Dean, hit me. Hit, tell me about Archer and Armstrong number two. More hilarity between the two. I was telling uh, Emily about this earlier today when they get put in the jail cell and like Archer's like, what are we going to do? And Armstrong's like, well, I'm taking a nap. I can't get the fuck out of here. What, what else is there to do? And, and then he's did like, oh, the, uh, the part where Exo is fighting the dinosaur, like comes through there and they're like, we don't see that every day. It's like, yeah, that's a, an Aryan in, in armor, like fighting the dinosaur. I thought they were trying to mate. <laughs> you know, like just, just really quick, really good, that dry British humor. I, I just can't get over the uh, the dynamic between the two where like they're going to have to go back and get Archer's crossbow because he's like, I made it myself. He's like, I, I get you a crossbow, kid. He's like, no, I need it. He's like, okay, okay. You know, and he's and he's like, I get it. I've, uh, I've you know, lost some things. He couldn't be replaced. He's put this armor on. He's so nonchalant. A lot like he compliments Mother God and somehow gets over on her, like like where she's like he's like oh you look pretty good and she's like listen kill the skinny one the fat one I ah, kind of charming let him go. <laughs> so Armstrong again like you said on the last podcast Derry he's into wine women in songs so like when he gives her a compliment you know the lady who thinks all men are liars she's like that Armstrong guy he's got something going on I believe him. Uh, I love Turok it's always great to see Turok I actually it was wildly enough. In like 1986 or seven, my parents bought me like 10 comics from the flea market for my birthday or not for Christmas. And like most of them were war comics. I was really into G.I. Joe and war at the time. But like one of them was like a Turok son of stone. And so I knew about Turok like before. I, you know, okay. And like my mom actually, because uh, I would ask her about these, like I said, about, you know, talk to her about the Ultraverse. I asked her about some of these characters at the time. And she was like, yeah, I know Turok son of stone. And she did not know Magnus. She didn't know Solar. She didn't know any like a lot of. But she know Turok for some reason. He ran. It ran forever. So you know, I mean, I get it. Wow. Probably had more issues than the others. Again, we get into close to what like again what you know we call Orientalism here, and that you know he's very treated the noble warrior from the from the primitive tribe or what have you. But it works for Turok, and I, I like. I like how he treats Archer where he's like, okay, you and I are equal. You know, I get where you're coming from. You get where I'm coming from. Archer's, a, you know, Armstrong's a fat slob. You know, it's really it's really funny to see that. It'd be interesting to go forward and see when they team up again, uh, how they interact, you know, during like the chaos effect or whatever. It just goes to show you also like how much power Mother God has that she's bossing someone like Turok. Nah, not just power, but the power to make people think that she's some kind of benevolent spirit. Turok's not an easily fooled guy, and it takes Archer being like, listen, kill me if you want, but she's evil. So as soon right. as you find that out, fight her. It takes something that like that grandiose and act of nobility to get Turok to realize he might be on the wrong side. So all of that stuff just really, I mean, it's just, a, it's a, it's a fun issue. And I, I really think my favorite part though, is totally when, uh, when he goes to take a nap, like I just laugh about that lives rent free in my head. It's like, oh, I would take a nap. It's been six months since I had a snooze. Yeah. I mean, for simply this issue is just them escaping and Turok showing up and them, you know, converting Turok against the mother God. Well, and that's it's also really all this is. Last ass Albert at the beginning who set them up to assassinate True. Erica, mother God. And then just like, Oh no, they were right. they kidnapped me. Right. I mean, what I, I guess. Putz. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, this issue was great. I, I, I mentioned before, but I love Archer and Armstrong. They're, they're my favorite of the Valiant characters. Uh, yeah, I was going to mention the, the mating Tyrannosaur scene. I thought that was great, but it also reminded me of something else. Uh, in many ways, Archer and Armstrong are the C-3PO and R2-D2 of the Unity crossover. Like, they have stuff to do. Don't get me wrong. They are very yeah. crucial to the plot. I'm not saying that they're not. But Armstrong especially is kind of just showing up and working his way through it. You know, he knows he's not a godlike figure. He's not Solar. He's not Exo. He's not Sting. Uh, he's very strong. and he seems He's not even his brother. To be honest. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. He hasn't sought out war. You know, when you drop him in a situation like this, he's not like, oh, we got to plan and get resources and make sure the enemy is on the back foot. He is, to your point, wondering if he can catch a good nap because he's probably going to survive this or he's not because of situation, you know, completely circumstances completely outside of his control. So I, I like that because it, it also allows you as the reader to not only see things from his way, but also just appreciate the spectacle like this scene 
scene with XO. XO doesn't even have any lines of dialogue. And we've read nope. XO comics. We know he's probably going on and on and on about the noble beast and how this is going to look in his room and right. his <laughs> men are going to respect him more. Like, we know that nonsense is going on. In, I once inside. killed the saber tooth tiger on the plains of Italy in I, the early yeah. days. This is the same. I smeared his blood on my face as I do this dinosaur now. He's mentioned repeatedly <laughs> how excited he is at the idea that dinosaurs are older than him and like oh this is isn't this great we found a world where there's something older than me because i am from a different era so you know and when he's going through all this and armstrong's just like what the hell is going on (laughs) that it 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 truly is witnessing to something ridiculous uh you know you you compared them to c-3po and uh, R2-D2, but in my mind, they're a lot like uh, Scooby and Scrappy-Doo. Like, you oh. have Armstrong, who's just like, I don't know, maybe we just chill out, and Archer's like, let's find some people, can we find some people? Is it time to find evil yet? <laughs> And also, I don't like Scrappy Doo, so I don't mean to besmirch Archer like that, who I do like, but he's just ready to go, and Armstrong is ready to go to sleep. <laughs> but but that's a really good analogy, because you're not supposed to like Archer. If Archer were the star of his own book, you'd be like, oh, this guy's insufferable. I hope he loses at whatever he's trying to accomplish. But when he's set against Armstrong, that's that's where the humor lies. Funny, so, yeah. Oh, yeah. And yeah, oh, yeah, you can like him, then you can like him, because if you're just reading his book, the fact that he's true gets a annoying like like when kurt angle debuted in the wwe in 99 and he shows up and he's all like hey i'm an american hero i won this medal you guys have never won a medal he's not trying to be an asshole it's just sort of it's true so archer's like yeah listen you're over there you're eating these candy bars you really shouldn't you know that right you know they're bad for you i I used to do this stuff but like i did a bunch of training now i know how to ninja kick you know i can show you how to ninja kick well your legs are a little small we'll show you something different and you're like you really mean well but boy you are not very nice (laughs) right Right. but you you need both of them too you do you do you do i like read a book about armstrong either because they're not going to read a book about a fat guy going to sleep you well, because I mean? he, that's what it he would wouldn't be. do anything. That's the right, point. Armstrong's yeah. whole thing. It's like it's like if if it were up to him, he would be at the center of a civilization. He'd be enjoying himself until the inevitable decline. And then he'd wander around until the next one. But it's that he keeps attracting these ardent followers to his side, and it's like, oh, you've survived for so long. You must be special. Give me the purpose that I'm looking for. And Armstrong's like, no, I've survived so long because I have avoided doing exactly what you are right, doing. Right. You're going to die. Uh, but I don't want it to be because of me. So I'm going to make sure that I'm standing at least next to you when harm comes your way. But but again, you know, Turok is a perfect foil for them because we, the reader, knows he's a good guy and he's going to be a big deal. And it's only these two schlubs <laughs> who are going to be able to convince him like, hey, listen, you might be on the wrong side of this, but I'm not saying this just because I want to live. I'm saying this because, you know, I, I am incredibly noble and because you don't seem to be able to kill me, there might be a reason why you were sent after it. So, again, it's just one of these things where if someone had handed this to me, I feel like I could have read it, not read another issue of Unity, and absolutely gotten my money's worth. So have you read, like, all of Volume 1 of Archer and Armstrong? I have not. I have been okay. meaning to. It's not really well collected. I read the right. entirety of Volume 2. I'm a huge Barry Windsor Smith fan, so I want to, and I'm hoping this will incentivize me to seek out what I'm missing. Yeah, because like, I was wondering if the book, because you're a bigger fan, you know, it seems like that I am, because I stopped around like issue three or four. But like, I wonder if like any of his other followers show up, and as one of them, the guy from Madison Square Garden with the knife, he's ready to go. <laughs> he might be, you know, he needs a little guidance, you know what I mean? He doesn't have it in his heart. If that guy would have just shown up and followed Armstrong, he might have some ready to kill people. Is that at the same time? Ready to go. He had a knife in his hand. This is 1992, right? Could this be the same? Could this be the same time period? It is. It is. It is. Armstrong was absolutely at that concert. If if it was, he knows that guy. He's like, oh, I wish I could have reached him. He was passing out mellow vapor. He's like, I found this outside of time. It doesn't matter. Here's some for everyone. Pass it down. Wow. We got there. We got there. We, we got, got there. there. Jeez. Got there. All right. Anything else on Archer and Armstrong and number two before we finish it up with Magnus Robot Fighter? Do you, Jesse, do you still not like Barry Windsor Smith's art? I'm, I'm lukewarm. <laughs> You're lukewarm. Okay. I just uh, don't understand. Like... <laughs> No, no, listen, man, to each their own. This is this no, no. is a visual medium. I get that. There are some like top tier artists I can't stand. 
Dan. No, like, no, that's think- my point. It's not that like he would like or dis- dislike him. <laughs> it's that he's lukewarm. Like the idea that you'd be in the middle. I know yeah. some people who hate Barry Windsor Smith's art. I know some people who love it. Jesse's the first guy who's like, I'm lukewarm in the middle. I'm in the yeah, middle. I, I, yeah, I. He draws. I mean, you might also try, honestly, or maybe we'll look at this sometime. Uh, Rune, where he's changed his style a little bit, and it, I think I think that's a better work. Honestly, I think his style works a little bit better when it's uh, less clean. This is very sleek stuff. But Jesse's read Cyberforce, so it takes a lot to like impress him. You got to got yeah. bring it. Mark Silvestri oh. grew the shit out of that. It is. You, I mean, I I get it though. He really did. did. He really did. Honestly, I'm. I'm. It sounds like I'm fucking shitting on Mark Silvestri, but no, it, it looks great. I'm. Yeah, I'm messing yeah. with Jesse ever. We are all avowed fans of Mark Silvestri. Mark, if you're listening to this, I I love you. Good call getting Simonson to do number zero. I read that the other day. Holds up. Did he really? I didn't even know that. Okay. Simonson like scripts and draws it, and I think uh, co plotted it. Man, those early image guys were throwing around money. Like, God bless. Yes. God, oh, no yes. kidding, man. That's, I'm no gonna, if kidding. I had a time machine, that's what I'd go back and do. I'd go back and put on a Walt Simonson mask and be like, <laughs> Can I do an issue of Spawn? Give me the money, please. I was Let's telling you guys like this. You like to talk about. I didn't even realize that Neil Gaiman had done the Angela miniseries, and I was just doing the math in my head. Like, how much, like, like the Todd McFarlane was just like, listen, I'm going to open this bag and I'm going to keep putting cash in it. You tell me when to stop. And then you go write the screen. Like, like this is the height of Sandman. And this guy does a three issue Angela series that he spends the next 20, 30 years suing McFarlane over. And it's yeah. just like, how much money was flown around the image at this time? It just, and he did the single issue mind. of Spawn too. Uh, yeah, right, right. right. When McFarlane was like, you think I can't write? I'll get some people who can. <laughs> Alvin Moore, Dave Sim, Neil Gaiman, Frank Miller. Graham Honestly, Watson. Honestly, uh, good move. Good move Damn. on his part. Sorry Indeed. sorry to distract for people who showed up for that premium value content. I apologize. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Magnus Robot Fighter number 16, Unity, Chapter 12. Story by Jim Shooter, written by Roger Stern. Pencil layouts by Howard Simpson. Art and color by Ernie Cologne. At the San Gabriel Memorial Stadium, Magnus looks to face off with the evil robot Talpa until Rai, Gilad, and Rocky land their ship directly on Talpa and convince Magnus to head to the Lost Land in order to prevent unity. Once there, Magnus meets the rest of the team and begins to confront Erika's forces. When Sting relays that Solar has possibly died, the team retreats. The next day, Magnus, Rai, Jeff, and the two Gilads decide they must find a place to plan their attacks as it looks like this is a war that's going to last for a while. 146 days later, the team has been raiding Erica's compound, but the war is far from over. When Jeff goes missing, they realize he has gone to Erica's compound, so the team creates a distraction in order to try to rescue him. When Magnus gets a chance, he sneaks into the facility to find Jeff, and when he does, Jeff tells him that Solar is alive. As luck would have it, Magnus finds Erica and attacks her and the equipment she was using to bring about Unity. Erica, though, proves to be too powerful, gravely injuring Magnus, but Harbinger Sting arrives to rescue Magnus and Jeff, escaping the compound. Unity has been delayed for now. Also of note, Harbinger's Chris has had her baby, who we now learn from Jeff the Geomancer is actually a young Magnus. This is a very long war. This isn't an event that's wrapped up in a couple days, folks. This thing goes on for months. You were like eight months in, right? It's like day one sixty seven or something, right, dude? We're we're get, we're getting there, yeah, for sure. It's it's like the one I had written down here earlier was day one fifty seven when the Gelads make their uh, uh, march on the complex to go and try and rescue Jeff. But anyway, okay. So the war to stop Unity may go on longer than originally expected. About five months later, Magnus gets his shot at Erica but comes up short. So, well, tell me about it, Dean Compton. I mean, I've got one note here, and it's kind of like the big spoiler. I'll just throw this out here, and then we, we can go over to you. Chris, we find out, is actually Magnus Robot Fighter's mom in this issue. Jeff drops the bomb and says, hey, Chris, by the way, your kid's going to grow up to be Magnus Robot Fighter. Woo! What do you think, man? Well, what a big reveal. And again, this is the kind of thing, again, that I talked about with this with this crossover. That's permanent. Like, this is how it's going to tie together. That has, that has like, huge ramifications of the value universe because no Magnus without him. Uh, and it makes sense uh, for the powers-wise because uh, the dad is Torque, who had – was super power who was had super strength and was somewhat invulnerable if memory serves. 
I love the spirit that Magnus uh, shows in this in this uh, comic book. He constantly presses forward. He takes advantage of a situation when it appears that like they think he's dead. Uh, the Mother God's forces think he's dead. He goes further in the complex, hooks up with Jeff. He's probably a little headstrong and should listen to Jeff a little more, but I like he jumps down and he just knocks the shit out of mother, like just punches her. And I freaking love it. And she's like, you're not just going to beat me with force, but you can tell he actually could right here because he's like, you can't, you can't let loose, you know, I'm, uh, I'm going to, I will sit here and punch you until, you know, you die, but she gets her reinforcements in. He hits her. He's like, wham. And then he's trying to take her out again. So close, but just so far away. Yeah. If he'd had another couple seconds, it feels like this thing would have been over right here, but, uh, but he did not And he winds up getting really fucked up and sting has to come save him. And that's a, uh, that's a really touching moment too, because, you know, later on we'll see, you know, exa- exactly why you know that happened because sting just shows up out of nowhere in this comic, but we'll, and that's one of the coolest things about this crossover too, is seeing the same events, from a slightly different point of view, you know, and watching them come together. That's a hard trick to pull off, and they're pulling it off here. Uh, Again, like I said, I really like how good of a guy Magnus has become after being a a crypto-fascist earlier. And honestly, ending the second, third, we're 66% of the way through this now, ending that with the big reveal that Chris's baby is Magnus, that's how you do it, man. That's how you do it, baby. I mean, that is is old school, all my children 101. (laughs) Soap opera. I, I mean that in a good way. Like, this is how you get people to keep tuning in. You're like, my God, oh, this is really, how's that going to work? Well, you'll yeah. see. There's a third part. That's right. Uh, yeah, this is kind of where we get our, I don't want to say uh, answer to Jeff being alive, but Jeff is alive. I mean, Jeff is is definitely alive. We don't know how, but he shows up and he's talking to Magnus. Ernie Cologne, once again, I definitely love what he's doing in this comic. And I, I got to look to see how long he stays on Magnus. I don't know if he drops off anytime soon or what, but I really do enjoy what he's doing here. I love that they juxtapose the birth of uh, Chris's kid with the scene you were talking about with Magnus getting close to ending the entire thing with Mother God, because it really seems like, oh, this this is it. This you know he he's gotten closer to it than anyone else. He's strong. He's determined. He's there. He's focused, and you know it's setting it against this birth where it's like, oh well, you know this kid's going to be born. It's going to be a moment of hope. It's going to end. You know maybe the last six will be about a different foe, and then it just gets you know it gets turned on its head. Like the kid is born, and they all have a piece of information that sting pete doesn't have and the the way uh it's drawn when chris says oh magnus oh you have to go save him you i didn't realize this. Him, yeah. you have to go save him and this kid again this peter parker scott summers put upon guy who who's who the love of his life uh, you know, had a baby with someone else. He's decided to raise him. He's been put in this situation. He's got this godlike power. I read on the Valiant Wiki that he was supposed to come out as gay eventually. Like, he's got a lot going on here. And to watch this woman who just gave birth tell him, like, you have to go save this other gorgeous future man. And she doesn't follow it up with, because he's that baby that we're holding in our arms. And to just see him react and go and just wield his incredible power, I thought was great. I, I thought it was an, really an earned moment like you had to have had all the beats uh, up until this point to deliver it so perfectly and to end the issue with magnus holding his infant self was just one of those things where it was like god damn man this story is not like anything else it really doesn't have any fears I, there was that bit of tension like is he going to make it back so he could actually see himself i wanted to see i wanted to see yeah. them too or is like hey is it <laughs> going to end here with the beginning of this more into like the uh the point of view from the harbinger folks i believe in like their issue that's coming up about like what you know how she like implores thing to like go and and save you know who is you know her baby like her son baby it's just so wild yeah like as as you watch this as it as it just all comes together like you said like if you like when you first start reading you're like man i hope somebody has a baby and then somebody holds themselves as an ass you know <laughs> later on in this like that would have been something you could have conceived but at this point like you said they've hit all the right beats to where like this is a pretty good payoff and you kind of feel like there's hope for the future and the yeah. past because time is not absolute that is correct. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know if it was planned this way, but I feel like these were very natural 
ending points. Like, again, this feels like it was written for the trade and absolutely was not. But if you gave someone the first six issues, I think they'd want the next one. I think if you gave someone these six issues, they absolutely would want the next one. And really, what more can you hope for? What more can be a stated goal of this than I want to see what happens next? I think when it was released in trade in the 90s, it was actually released in two parts, which also works fairly well. Like, they didn't give you the whole book. But, yeah, you're right. Like, and I think, again, it's it just talks to Shooter's ability and the fact that there's one big architect. It is hitting every beat at the right time. Also, like, you needed, you know, uh, again, we use a lot of wrestling terms on here. You needed a hope spot. Like, the, the, the bad guys had gotten over a whole bunch. You needed a thing to make you be like, oh, the good guy's got a moment. Having this baby is that moment. Seeing Magnus hold himself is that moment. Like I said, this might just work out, you know, for everybody. Almost does, you know, in in a lot of ways. Like you said, you said it's just without peer. And that's why I keep going to, I'm like, I just don't know that there's a better superhero crossover, maybe of all time and certainly of the 90s. Like, and that's why, because I just, I don't think of any other story hitting these beats When you hit them all, when you take the whole encompassing uh, crossover as well as this one does with these like natural points to make you want the next part. Well said. Absolutely. Now, Dean, did you have a question for us regarding these covers? Did you want to drop that on? Yeah, that's the last thing I was going to say. So the first uh, first six covers like they uh, they make up one big thing that Frank Miller drew. Zero unity zero and one don't have right like they're not part of it, but it's like eight each of the others. Walt Simonson draws eight, Frank Miller draws eight, they all come together. So which do y'all like better? Like Frank Miller's looks more metaphysical, Simonson's looks more like Jack Kirby's world of tomorrow. It looks like something designed by Jack Kirby. <laughs> Well, that's where I'm going, buddy. I'm going uh, with, I almost call him Barry Windsor Smith for some reason. Why <laughs> Why would I do that? Yeah. Why Why would I do that? Walt Simonson. And I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that there's a lot of white on him. Just because that makes, for some reason, it seems to pop out a lot more to me. The Frank Miller covers. Frank Miller has this style that it just seems kind of grimy and dirty. That's kind of what I get. I mean, for a cosmic level book we've got going on here, there's still that bit of griminess sometimes. Plus, I like the fact that we're looking at with Simonson stuff, it all being that landscape that they're involved in this big battle. Frank Miller's is like, you know, each each cover could definitely stand on its own as being its own thing. And the only thing behind it that's kind of drawing them together is just the hands. I, I'll take Simonson <laughs> there. <laughs> Big old cosmic hands, not for me. Not, I'll pass on that. Derry, what do you think, man? Uh, I am the opposite. I I very much preferred the Miller covers, uh, and you actually said the reason why. I didn't realize they were connected the first time I read this, and it wasn't until I saw online that they did connect and form the hands that I uh, I thought, oh, this is really interesting. Um, I think the, the Walt Simonson one is beautiful, and I don't have a single negative thing to say about it. Uh, I think it's great. I tried to find a high-res version of it to save it just to have to, to pour over. Uh, Simonson is an incredible artist and an even better storyteller, but I, I'm just a sucker for Miller, and the way he distills each one of the characters and what I would, you know, refer to as an iconic shot, even when it's it's Harbinger and it's the whole team, I love. Uh, I, I, I don't mind the busy stuff, but if I got to pick one or the other, I'll take this because it's easier just to soak them in. I mean, even the way he, lo- he lays out the solar cover where you have the moon in the background and solar's going down, half swimmer, half astronaut, I think it really gives you a sense of what each one of these characters are. He's also very small all in the frame, uh, but you you know you put that up against something like the Eternal Warrior or EXO, where it's like these are big, strong guys, and they are talking to you with their fists. They don't have the you know cosmic consciousness to deal with. Uh, I thought I thought Miller just nailed it. And, and when you put them together, the the big hands, you know, we know that that's one of the cosmic entities here. But again, it just seems to evoke like these big crossovers, you know, like. Excuse me, like Galactus, the Celestials, the Anti Monitor, Krona, like these big, like someone wants to, Dr. Doom wants to get the powers of God and reform the universe, except it's valiant, it's Mother God, and she's really personal. And, uh, you know, you're going to watch these people deal with that. So I, I loved it. I, it was a, it was a great surprise. And, uh, I, again, I just, this book keeps paying dividends. I don't know how else to say it. Well, what I really like about him, first off, is the Frank Miller stuff kind of, Frank Miller covers, kind of represent the metaphysics, while the 
Simons and stuff represents the physical reality of it. Like they're fighting in front of a big machine, but Frank Miller's evokes like here's a, a godlike hands that are reshaping everything around these characters. Uh, if you ask me on any day, I could probably switch depending on which aspect of the story I was more interested in at any given time. Because that's the thing I really like about these covers coming together like this is they actually they sort of tell the story in a way. Like here's this, you know, like I said, the Frank Miller godlike power, the people fighting in the future past you know in front of this uh indescribable machine i probably like simonson more simonson's more just because i like simonson more as a general rule but much like Derry said what are you going to say that's bad about the frank miller one i think and i think the grunginess lends itself to that because creation isn't usually pretty and so like if this is being remade and created it probably you know it looks a little grungy things haven't developed yet they haven't gotten to where they're supposed to go on the other hand simonson's is like the apex of development so it's sleek and looks good and he signs his name like a dinosaur and i like to find it on his uh, <laughs> drawing so so i like that about it so um uh, so i like simonson a little more just as a general rule so i probably like this a little more but you can't you could not go wrong either way for both uh aesthetic appeal and relation to the story so i mean it's just a really really cool really cool idea i don't know whose idea it was to have them do it this way really smart whoever it was because Again, in the summer of 92, these are a couple big guns to, to pull out, and you're pulling them out on multiple covers, and they're covers that form like one bigger, you know, uh, one bigger scene. That's really, really clever and cheap in an era, more expensive gimmicks that would have cost you more than with guys that, you know, maybe don't have the name power, the gravitas of a Miller and a Walt Simonson. Very good. All right. Well, hey, we've come to the end of the second episode. Act, the second part of Unity, and uh, we're going to close up shop here. We're going to finish things up in a couple days with our third part of Unity, which is going to be issues 13 through 18. Am I right? Yep. 13, 13 through 18. I can't, I can't do math. So that's going to be a lot of fun. So, uh, Dean Compton, we do some stuff on the Unspoken Decade. We'll tell them all about it. Yeah, man. So we're at the UnspokenDecade.com. We just dropped an article about the Max. And, of course, we're on Facebook and uh, at Unspoken Decade on Twitter, where I've been having a, a lot of fun uh, just interacting with different people, uh, coming through, just, you know, tweeting some tweeting some scenes from 90s comics and also retweeting some stuff that, come, that comes around that I think is interesting. Uh, you know, so it's really a lot of fun hanging out with people there. Come see me. Come come talk to me. I'm very lonely. I don't have <laughs> Yeah. These guys pretend to be my friends, but they're not really. They're mean to be as soon as this goes off. No, for real, oh, they're yeah. great. But also, yeah. for real, come see us. That's right. Come on over. All right. Well, hey, uh, yeah, you could check out the Unspoken Issues podcast on the W2M Network if you're listening to us. Most likely that's where you found us with the W2M Network. Uh, uh, that that whole network holds this feed along with the Source Material Comics podcast feed, which is usually where you're going to find this pop up as well. Look, just be ready. We we got more stuff in the can here for you. U- Unity is going to be finishing up here in a couple of days, and I'm sure there's all sorts of great comic book content, especially '90s comic book content out there. I'm throwing stuff on, up on TikTok. You might want to you might want to go check it out. Watch, you know, hear a few hear a few familiar voices. Uh, Hello, talk about some- fellow kids. <laughs> TikTokers, but yeah, you can check out some of the some clips from previous episodes that we've had aired, and I throw them up with some pictures and try to make it interesting. But uh, with that being said, we are getting out of here. This has been Unity Part Two. That's Derry Wait. That's Dean Compton. I'm Jesse Starcher. We'll be talking to you soon. Thanks for joining us. Have a good one. Uh, bye bye. Thanks for joining us. Unspoken Issues is part of the UnspokenDecade.com, the home for 90s comics, blogs, and podcasts. Unspoken Issues also has a Facebook group you can join if you are interested. Just search the Unspoken Issues podcast and request to join. All of this would not be possible without W2Mnet.com and the Rattelich and Broadcasting Network, so make sure to seek them out for more podcasts. If you enjoyed what you heard today, please feel free to share, and we look forward to entertaining you again soon. (laughs) 